Welcome. Welcome to the University of Maine's annual Senator George, J. Lecture, uh, Senator George J. Mitchell Lecture on Sustainability. My name is David Hart. I'm the leader of the Sustainability Solutions Initiative, or SSI for short, and the director of the Senator George J. Mitchell Center, which is the home for SSI. Many of you are already familiar with SSI, but for those of you who aren't, it's an innovative program in which teams of faculty and students from universities and colleges around the state are working to help Maine communities solve urgent problems at the intersection of economic, social, and environmental issues. Regardless of where you look in Maine, there's a good chance you'll find an SSI team at work, whether helping to balance economic development with natural resource protection in local towns, to develop alternative energy in ways that respond to community needs and environmental concerns, to strengthen the capacity of coastal communities to cope with extreme floods, to improve transportation planning in southern Maine, or prepare for the arrival of insect pests that threaten forests and livelihoods. In these and many other partnerships, SSI's goal is nothing less than to create a brighter future in and beyond Maine. That's an unconventional goal for a research team, and it's matched by SSI's unusual approach. SSI teams have rolled up their collective sleeves to work with citizens and other stakeholders in a shared process of identifying the problems and developing the solutions. This two-way exchange with, between researchers and stakeholders helps produce a better understanding of the problems and a greater likelihood of identifying and implementing the solutions. We're very fortunate today to have Senator Mitchell and Professor Pamela Matson with us to talk about the challenges and opportunities in solving these kinds of sustainability problems. Before I introduce Pam, I want to mention a few details and say a few thank yous. The lecture is being recorded for MPBN's Speaking in Maine series. And following the lecture, there's going to be a wonderful reception with lots of great food in the Grand Fourier at the Collin Center for the Arts, just 20, uh, 200 meters down the hill. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that. I'd like to thank several of the sponsors and supporters of this event, not the least the National Science Foundation's EPSCoR program, without which SSI would be impossible. So very grateful there to the main EPSCoR office, to the Mitchell Center and their staff, and to everyone involved in SSI. As a leader of SSI, I have the great pleasure of working with an amazing team. So if you're among the several hundred members of this team, whether as faculty, undergraduates, high school students, doctoral students, uh, postdoctoral researchers, external partners, members of the advisory board, or if you just happen to have one of our messy t-shirts, please stand for a moment. If you look around and realize how many people are involved from how many different fields and walks of life, you'll see that SSI is much more than a pioneering research initiative. It's a social movement in the making. So we're in for a real treat today. Pam Matson is here. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, she grew up near the banks of the St. Croix River in western Wisconsin. Her grandparents were farmers, and she credits her grandmother with introducing her to the natural world. After double majoring in biology and English as an undergraduate, she felt the tug of the emerging environmental movement and returned to graduate school. While completing her master's degree at, at Indiana University and her PhD at Oregon State University, she began to hone her extraordinary skills in analyzing the complex reciprocal interactions between human activities and ecosystem processes. After completing her PhD, she began working as a research scientist at NASA Ames Research Center. And while conducting cutting edge research on the effects of deforestation in the Amazon on the emission of trace gases to the atmosphere, Pam experienced this tension that has been felt by a growing number of scientists during the last few decades. The complex ecosystem processes she was studying were a fascinating scientific detective hunt in their own right but her research also suggested that such deforestation would have serious consequences for the health of the planet. 
Many researchers might have been tempted to focus all of their efforts on untangling the complexities and mysteries of such complex processes. But Pam took a different road and, as Robert Frost said, that has made all the difference. As she'll illustrate in today's lecture, she set out to mobilize interdisciplinary teams in partnership with diverse stakeholders to help improve human well-being while protecting the planet's life support systems. Since embarking on that road less traveled, Pam has become a global leader in the emerging field of sustainability science, which seeks to provide the scientific tools and social capacity to help address the challenge of sustainable development. At Stanford, she has helped catalyze a remarkable institutional transformation focused on sustainability. Along the way, she's also been awarded a MacArthur Fellowship and been elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Another of Pam's countless leadership roles is as director of the Leopold Leadership Program, a remarkable professional development program that has helped more than 200 natural and social scientists and engineers move from traditional academic roles to a solutions-oriented focus on a wide range of sustainability problems. So she's not just a change agent, she's a change agent on steroids. And I say that advisedly, having Senator Mitchell here, uh, admiring as I do all his great work uh, to eliminate the use of performance enhancing drugs in baseball. Uh, all I would say here is that I think uh, Pam comes uh, upon her, her leadership skills uh, naturally. In short, Pam's a brilliant scientist, a visionary and inspiring leader, and a special friend Please join me in welcoming her to the University of Maine. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your very, very kind introduction and for encapsulating my life in such an, uh, a nice way. Thank you for that. Thank you so much for inviting me to come to speak, to give the Senator George J. Mitchell Lecture on Sustainability this year, uh, and to interact with so many wonderful people in SSI and the Center and the rest of the university. This has been an incredibly fun visit already, and I'm looking forward to the rest of it because I'm learning from you, and I appreciate that. What I'd like to do in my talk is share a little bit about my perspectives on what it's gonna take for us to move in a transition to sustainability. Now let's see, David, do I get my slides easily here? Okay. I'll, I'll give a little bit of an overview perspective and then I, I would like to take just a few moments to focus in on some of my own research and share with you some of the things that we've learned uh, through a couple of decades of research on sustainability in one place, in one um, relatively small region of Mexico. And then, I'll, and then I'll return, hopefully, to a discussion we can all have about what it's going to take for a transition to sustainability. Now, we're, I've been using the word sustainability, so I think it probably makes sense for me to define it. Of course, there are a lot of different ways. A lot of people talk about the triple bottom line or the three-legged stool of economics, environment, and social well-being, and I completely buy that definition. But the one that I use is one that, is a, that we created as part of the Board on Sustainable Development of the National Academy of Sciences back in the 1990s. This activity, by the way, was led by Robert Cates, uh, one of, one of a, a person who is close to this organization and many others. And we basically said sustainability is about meeting the needs of people today and in the future. That is our needs for food and energy and water and shelter and education and employment and so on. And about sustaining the life support systems of the planet. And by that I mean our atmosphere and water systems, our climate system, and the species and ecosystems on land and in the oceans that provide so many of the things that we need and so many of the things that our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren are going to need. Very simple statement, easy statement, but incredibly huge challenge. 
Now, if you look on the social side and ask how are things going today, you could say things have improved. You know, lifespans are increasing. Infant mortality rates are in decline around the world. More people have access to uh, education and health care than ever before. And yet, there are a billion adults, mostly women, who can't read. A couple of billion people who don't have access to clean water or sanitation or modern forms of energy. Almost a billion people go to bed hungry a lot of the time. Um, and there's a widening disparity between the world's richest and the poorest. And this is today at 7 billion people. We're going to grow our planet to 9 or 10 billion people before we level off for the first time in human history, sometimes towards the middle of the century. So we've got huge challenges here. Likewise, if you look on the life support system side, again, yes, we've, we've uh, learned some things. We've improved some things. We know how to deal with point source solution, uh, um, pollution. We know how to deal with air quality in cities. But now we have region-wide tides of smog. And we are um, changing the climate because of our changes in the atmosphere. We're acidifying the oceans. Um, biodiversity is, is, is being lost very rapidly. Um, and the list goes on down. We've altered the global system because of our activities in very many different ways. And if you look at um, why, basically, I think it's, it's fair to say that very often in the past, our attempts to meet the needs of people have inadvertently had a negative consequence on those life support systems. And our challenge for the future is to turn that relationship around, to figure out how to do these two things together and to meet the needs of people while sustaining the life support systems of the planet. So we don't really know how to do this yet. Um, there's lots and lots of experiments going on, and I see many of them going on in Maine. Um, we're learning as we go. We're making some mistakes. But we're in the process. We are in what I like to think of as a transition to sustainability. Um, we are making progress, but I think we have to move it a lot faster than we have been doing in the past. And so we can ask, what is it going to take? And that's what I want to talk about for the first part of my, my comments. What's it going to take for a transition for sustainability? Well, three things here um, are things that we in academic institutions can really play a role in. Um, we, we, in some sense, own these, although other organizations do as well. And we have, an, in a sense, a responsibility to play. Um, there's a lot of other things on this long list. I'll come back to those at the very end. But let me focus on the top three, and I'll start with knowledge, tools, and approaches. Of course, this is what we love to do in research institutions like this one and like mine at Stanford University. We love to do research, develop new ideas. Um, and in fact, I think you can look at uh, the situation today and say that the decades of research that we've been doing have dramatically improved our understanding of the sustainability challenges on the planet. We understand what's going on and why it's going on. And those lists, like that one there that I showed you at the very beginning, um, are there because of all of that research. We know what's going on. But unfortunately, not all of that understanding is, has been directed towards solutions. Part of our problem here is that most of our incentive systems, basically, in research focus us at the edge of, these, of this matrix. A lot of us, for example, study climate change. What's happening with climate change? Why exactly is it happening? Um, that's not necessarily research to support solutions. Uh, a lot of work going on on energy, alternative energy and everything else, fine. Um, but is that sustainability-focused research? Not necessarily. It becomes sustainability research, I believe, when it's at the interface of the needs of people and the life support systems of the planet. So for example, all of the research going on on low or no carbon, low cost forms of energy to meet the needs of the world, that, that's great sustainability science, worrying about climate change as well as energy needs. But better than that are the approaches that recognize all of these things are interacting. Now take the biofuels example. I wish we had done this for biofuels. Here we have an energy focus, um, research that was focused on, ener on energy in part to reduce climate change impacts. But in fact, it affects our, those, that solution affects energy, 
yes, affects climate change, yes, but also affects food and water resources and water and air quality and, and ecosystems and so on. We need to think about um, the full suite of interactions of our decisions. So I think if we're going to meet sustainability goals, we're going to have to focus more of our R&D um, at the nexus of these things, at the interface, at the intersection of human needs and life support systems. That, I think, is, is one key element of this emerging field of sustainability science, focusing on the intersection and the interactions between human and environment systems, between the needs of people and, and the planet. Focusing on knowledge creation also, not just for understanding, but for problem solving with a solution orientation. And obviously that's got to be done in par partnership with decision makers. I'm going to come back to that point in a little while. Um, sustainability science is also usually interdisciplinary or, disciplinary, uh, or multidisciplinary in its character. And that's because these kinds of problems are so complex that no one discipline working alone has a chance of, of, um, of working towards a solution. And then finally, I'd say sustainability science is often place-based. Now, um, I was reading something that Senator Mitchell wrote that really explains why this is true so clearly. And I, didn't, I don't have the quote, but I'll paraphrase it. He said something along the lines that every place has its own cultural and spiritual and political and biophysical characteristics um, and its own set of challenges. And so analyses and, and efforts towards sustainability solutions has to be, has to be uh, situated in that place. And I think that's true for a lot of what we do. But I also think that by studying places, we can um, compare across them and learn general things that are useful in just about any place around the world. Okay, so that's sustainability science. The good news is I think it's emerging. Um, there is lots of work going on. There are lots of publication venues like this one that was launched by Bob Cates and Bill Clark and myself and others. Um, and it's, um, it's sending a message that this kind of work focused on the human environment system, focused on solutions, is valued in um, the highest realms of science as well as by decision makers. Luckily, I think we're seeing more and more of a call to arms for this kind of work in many, many different areas, a reorientation of research. I think our, our uh, funding agencies are pushing us, are enc encouraging us to move in this direction. Um, foundations, corporations, institutions like this one are, are calling for that reorientation. And I just will show you this quick slide to say that in the field of global environmental change, which is an area that a lot of us have worked in for many years, um, even here there's a recognition that we've spent decades trying to understand what's happening on the planet. Now it's time to refocus some of our attention to helping solve the problems. There's also a call to arms in our universities, and the one that you're sitting in right here today is a great example of that. We are establishing institutes and centers and schools and initiatives to help uh, organize and, and, and mobilize the expertise of the whole university and bring it to bear um, on sustainability challenges. And we're finding incentive systems to help encourage that. Um, and you know, there's lots of stories about how different universities are doing it, but the fact is there may not be any one right way, but, the, but we're all, we're all work, working together. So we could go on and on about that factor. Um, I don't want to say much more other than to say, when I say new knowledge, tools, and approaches, I don't want to ignore the fact that part of our challenge is to integrate new knowledge with known information, with experiential knowledge, with traditional knowledge. Lots of different types of knowledge have to come together for sustainability. Now let me go to, on to the second one on my list, and that is linking knowledge to action. This, to me, is the huge challenge. Um, I think it's true that even when we have knowledge that's relevant, it seldom is actually used um, in decisions and in action. And I think there's a reason, for, one of the reasons for that anyway, is us, you know, the research community. A lot of us um, believe that if we do research, 
that is focused on problems and actually has useful information in it. All we need to do is, is to write that paper and at the end of the scientific paper we'll have a paragraph that says, and therefore decision makers should dot 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 and then we put it out there in the literature through that pipe and it comes out on the other end and we expect that decision makers will pick it up and use it. Well unfortunately um, a lot of the time we've asked the wrong question. The decision makers aren't interested in what we've been studying. Sometimes we've asked the right question but we've missed one really critical piece of information that prevents decision makers from using that new knowledge or tools and sometimes the decision maker that we assume is there isn't there at all. So what do you do about that? How can we more effectively link the knowledge that is being developed in great places like this with action for sustainability? This is a researchable question. I'm pleased to say there are a whole bunch of people here in this university who are studying that. It is something that I've been engaged in my own work, um, both as the chair of the Roundtable on Science and Technology for Sustainability at the National Academies, and also in my own research uh, with partners like Bill, Bill Clark and, and Louis LaBelle and others around the world. We basically analyzed many, many different cases and then did some cross-case comparisons to try to, to bring home lessons. And I'm going to give you a very quick look at what those lessons are. First of all, we identified three critical barriers that get in the way of linking knowledge and action. The first is mutual miscomprehension between scientists and decision makers. The bottom line is most of us anyway are in different cultures. We are asking different questions. We think about data in different ways. We have different cares and, and, and concerns. And often we're sort of crossing in the night. We're not having a, a real conversation. Um, so what do you do about that? Well, one of the things that, that effective um, linking of knowledge to action cases do is that they promote multi-directional information flow and dialogue. They find ways to get decision makers and the research community together. Um, and there's lots and lots of examples of that. At Stanford we have something we call uncommon dialogues, uh, frequent interactions between NGOs, corporate, government, and academics around particular issues. But there, there's lots and lots of ways to do that. Another thing that successful um, groups have done is promote collaborative production of trusted knowledge. That is, they've engaged the decision makers or the stakeholders in the research. And so what comes out at the other end of that process is something that is, is credible and, and trusted. <clears throat> to, to accomplish those things, um, we've found that many um, organizations are successful if they establish some kind of boundary spanning capability. It might be an organization like a center, it might be a key individual, it might be some uh, tools or models that bring people together, but some kind of capability that spans these boundaries between research and decision making and even uh, among different types of decision makers and different types of researchers. Um, and those things are, are critical, and I'm struck as I come here today that Maine's Sustainability Solutions Initiative is exactly that. It's a boundary um, organization that purposefully links this great scientific strength of this university with the great strength of the stakeholders and decision makers in the, in the uh, state. So congratulations to you on that. One other thing that we learned about linking knowledge to action is that all too often the knowledge system is fragmented. Let me tell you what I mean by that. You know, you've all heard of supply chains, corporate supply chains, some, something that's managed very carefully to make sure all the pieces are in place so that the product comes out uh, on time in the right place. Well, we have supply chains in, chains in this linking knowledge to action as well. We've got all kinds of research being produced, um, knowledge being developed, translation occurring all the way through to um, adoption and diffusion. But there's nobody, usually for sustainability goals, there's nobody or no organization that's making sure that that supply chain has all the pieces in place. And all too often in our case studies, there were links that were broken in that chain. So we need, um, in order to, to be successful in this, 
somebody somewhere has to be playing the role of trying to make sure all the pieces in the supply chain are connected. And that's something we can come back to talk about. There are some nice examples of that. Finally, we learned that uh, one thing that really gets in the way of linking knowledge and action is when the, 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 the method for linking knowledge and action is inflexible in the face of change. The world is rapidly changing. Uh, there are social changes, political, economic changes happening locally to globally. Um, you cannot set up one linking function between the knowledge and, and, and uh, decision making functions and expect that it's going to remain. Um, you got to have an agile system that can evolve and change over time. I've got some great examples of that from China where I've recently have been working uh, where they're really trying hard to extend uh, really wonderful agricultural practices for sustainable agriculture into the countryside. And they're doing a good job, but they've forgotten that meanwhile, no place is fa changing faster than China, and that they're going to have to update and change that extension or linking function as they go. Lots of examples of that. Okay, so those are some of the, some of the things we've learned about linking knowledge and action. Lots more to talk about. As I say, actually one of the things I'm so happy to be here for is I'm learning from you because you are actually engaged in and studying that process. Third thing, educating our students, educating the public. Now, um, I'm going to be very brief here, but it's, I think, important because we, we actually realize that in order for a sustainability transition to to occur and to move quickly, it's all about having leaders who get the, get the message. And we're here educating leaders. So there's been quite a bit of interesting research now that has begin, begun to identify the kind of education that um, prepares people for this fast-changing world in with, with goals for sustainable development. Um, they have to be systems thinkers, strategic thinkers. They have to understand uncertainty. Um, they have to be able to respect multiple perspectives and so on. Um, and you can actually build this into educational programs. You can build it into individual courses. And th the few studies that have been done on individual courses show that students' lives are changed, basically, when as a freshman they enter a university in which they're shown, um, they're given multiple perspectives on a particular issue. They're not told the one answer. But, but in a sense forced to engage in the question. Lots more to do there. The second is interdisciplinary programs. These are, these are popping up everywhere. Um, they uh, are, uh, take different forms in different universities. At Stanford, we have one that's called the Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources. It's a sustainability program that's complementary to all of our disciplinary ones. I can tell you the demand is huge for these kinds of programs. We have enough experience with them now to know that if they're conducted well, the students do incredibly well. They have both depth and breadth, and they succeed in their worlds. And then finally, one last comment on, on educating leaders, um, and I've had this conversation here today. Problem-based learning, uh, giving students an opportunity to engage in interdisciplinary team efforts, service learning that's about helping uh, communities with sustainability challenges, these things are life-changing for students. And many of our universities now are engaging in them as a way of both educating uh, future leaders, but also interacting um, and serving our communities. So we could go on and on, but I'm not going to here. I want to switch now to a case study, and I'll, I'll try to illustrate these three different areas in that case study. Um, that I've been involved in for now almost 20 years. And this is a study of sustainable agriculture in the Yaki Valley. It's in that yellow box up there. As you can see, in the state of Sonora, in the country of Mexico. That Yaki Valley box there is right in the middle of the Sonoran Desert. And the valley itself is about 250,000 hectares of irrigated wheat, shown in that red. Uh, right in the middle of the Sonoran Desert. And it's um, located right on the Sea of Cortez. Let me go back for a moment. That body of water to the left of the yellow box. Sea of Cortez is one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. Every conservation organization in the world works there because it is so important. 
Liaki Valley was a, a place that, that a number of us began working in around 1992. Uh, Roz Naylor is an economist. Ivan Ortiz Monasterio is an agronomist. Myself, and over the years, many dozens of other people working together to try to understand sustainability challenges. This is an interesting place because it is basically the home of the Green Revolution for wheat. It's where Norman Borlaug and all of his colleagues back in the 1950s and 60s did the research that led to the development of high yielding wheat varieties that then spread throughout the developing world and were instrumental in um, keeping food production at pace with population growth over the last 50 years. Very exciting place. It's also the home of, of CIMIT, uh, the International Maize and Wheat Research Institute. Um, and um, lots of people come there to work and so forth. The farmers in the Aki Valley have been incredibly successful in terms of increasing the yields of wheat there. The green line on that graph is um, the average yields for the Yaki farmers over time from the 50s all the way up through the 90s. You can see that their farmers were incredibly, they're, they're way up at the top. They are, they've done very well. So you can say, why, why the Yaki farmers been so successful? Well, first of all, they had access to all that, those new varieties of wheat, all that new technology, basically. They also had access to all the water they could use. Despite being in the middle of the desert, they were, had an unending supply, supposedly, from reservoir systems. Um, and they used it incredibly inefficiently. All through the Green Revolution years, they had that water. I'll, I will mention that they ran out of it. They pumped themselves dry during a drought at the end of the 90s, which set up a whole other set of issues that I won't talk about today. But uh, until that point, water was not an issue. And they had all the fertilizer they could want. Now, when they started agriculture in this valley, they, had, they were using very small amounts of fertilizer. Not everybody was even using fertilizer. That's the, the, the chart, the graph on, I mean, the bar on the left-hand side of that chart. But by, um, because of subsidies and encouragement by the government, basically, by 1980, everybody was applying fertilizer. They were applying enough. Everything should have been fine. However, you can see that fertilizer application rates continue to increase to 97 and thereafter. And that, for us, was a red flag. Basically, they're over-fertilizing now, applying it in excess of crop requirements, and that sets up the situation for lots of environmental problems. That was one of the reasons we noticed this place to begin with. So we studied many different sustainability problems over this period of time. And I'm not, oh, not going to talk about any more than just one, and that's that over-fertilization question. And I'm going to frame it very simply. We asked, what are the economic and agronomic and, and environmental reasons they're doing things, and what are the consequences there? And are there ways to do it better? Are there win-win um, alternatives? So very quickly, we did a whole year's worth of biogeochemistry and agronomic research to try to figure out what happens to nitrogen in these systems. Um, most of it is applied before they plant the crop. And then you can see from all of those arrows all kinds of loss pathways. The first two gases up on top there are air pollutants. That one N2O is nitrous oxide. That's a greenhouse gas. Those are emitted in huge quantities from these systems. At the bottom, there's also losses of ammonium and nitrate, nitrate going into groundwater and causing uh, groundwater levels that are far in excess of, of drinking water standards in the U.S. or Mexico. Um, and both ammonium and nitrate moving in to streams and rivers that lead from the land to the ocean. And in the ocean, that extra nutrient um, causing huge uh, algal blooms, huge phytoplankton blooms, like the ones that you always read about in the Gulf of Mexico that ca cause the dead zones. So we, we see, uh, and this is just a tiny bit of the, the data, a huge sort of region-wide negative consequence of over-fertilization in agriculture. Um, I want to mention here that this, this uh, I mentioned before the importance of the marine uh, conservation in the Sea of Cortez, and you can see those algal blooms swirling across the whole system and into areas that are very, very important marine preserves. 
Okay, so at the same time we were trying to figure out what was going on, we were asking why do farmers do what they do? Why do they apply fertilizers at such high rates and um, in such an inefficient way? Well, fertilizers used to be cheap. They were heavily subsidized, although recently in the mid-1990s, the farmers were starting to have to pay a lot more for them. Um, they had good rational reasons about labor and machinery and, and um, you know, rainfall issues. But the bottom line was experience says it's work, so why not just keep doing what we've been doing? So then we began a full set of studies, both field studies and simulations, um, you know, co computer simulations and other things to help us figure out if there were good win-wins out there. And we found, yes, there, is, there are a couple of ways that we could save farmers money and reduce the environmental consequences of agriculture in this valley. Um, they just needed to apply less fertilizer, more carefully timed to crop demand, and they could maintain or increase yields, they could reduce nitrogen losses tenfold, they could save 12 to 18 percent of after-tax profits, they could make money on this. So we wrote that up in a paper and put it into the journal Nature. <laughs> in the last paragraph said, and therefore farmers should, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> but because of my wonderful colleagues in Mexico, we also worried a lot about linking knowledge and action. And we did that through kind of tri tr tried and true methods. We did on-farm trials over a number of years, sort of proving to farmers on their own land that these approaches would work. Farmer workshops, field days, we worked with extension agents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we went back and figured um, what we expect to see is that these dramatically increasing rates of fertilizer application would reverse, they would drop, because farmers would realize they don't need to put that much on, and they could save money by not. We went out and measured it, did farm surveys, guess what? We were wrong. In fact, fertilizer application rates were increasing. It was like, the more the better. Just throw as much on as you can. So obviously we had missed something there. And that caused us to go back and, and carefully look at what we thought the decision system was versus what it really was. When we first started working in the Yaki Valley, this is what we thought it was. So there's universities up there in that box, working with Simit, uh, Ivan Ortiz Monasterio was a very key individual there, working with the, the national research centers and, and uh, innovative farmers. And you know, we thought if we, if we made all those connections work, we'd be, we'd be in. When we actually analyzed the knowledge system, it looks something like this, much more complicated, many more influential players in decision making here some players that should have been influential that weren't, like the Secretary of Health and the Secretary of Agriculture, I mean, um, uh, Natural Resources up there. But a lot of players, and most importantly, we found that the credit unions were the real decision makers in this system, not the farmers. So we began to try to figure out what the credit unions were about there. The credit unions, by the way, are organizations that farmers belong to and that they get credit but they get access to markets, they get input, access to inputs like fertilizer, they get advice, et cetera, et cetera. They're trusted organizations. Well, the credit unions, it turns out, were giving advice to farmers, but that advice had strings attached. In other words, they had to do what the credit unions suggested they do if they wanted to get credit. And the credit unions were saying, throw as much on as you can possibly throw. So, of course, there were a couple motivations there. The credit unions were making money because they were loaning the credit to buy all that fertilizer, but they were also responding to something that was very real and very important, and that is uncertainty. They're risk averse. The real world has a lot of variability year to year, from farm to farm, from soil to soil, from farmer manager to farmer manager. So they didn't want to deal with that variability. They just wanted everybody to put on as much as they could possibly do. So our solution to that then was to, in a sense, start over, develop new uh, in situ sort of real-time information for farmers so that they would know how much fertilizer their particular field needed in a particular year. And most importantly, we engaged the credit unions and the farmers in that research. 
Um, and it's led to a very broad expansion of this approach and a very dramatic decline in the rate of, of fertilizer application that is now actually spreading around Mexico and the developing world, thanks to my colleague, Ivan Ortiz Monasterio. So that's, you know, that's the, uh, the brief vignette from the Yaqui Valley. Um, I wanted just to give you a couple of the lessons learned. There's a lot of them written up in this book called Seeds of Sustainability, but just a couple of take home messages. In terms of the interdisciplinary research, um, it is absolutely true that none of us working alone would have asked the same questions or gotten the same answers as we got by working together in a truly interdisciplinary way. That was key to getting it, getting it right. Um, it's also true, though, that within our individual disciplines and interdisciplines, we were able to do discovery science as well as problem-solving science. We, we did make some really important contributions to the science, science um, uh, scientific knowledge base, but we did it at the same time that we were um, focused on solutions. So that, that's sometimes a myth that you can only do one or the other. Oops. In terms of linking, the linking knowledge to action issue, um, I think it's quite probably obvious to you what we learned, and that is that you can't assume you know who the decision makers are. So if you really want to make a difference, you actually have to evaluate it, analyze it, study the knowledge system, um, the decision-making system, so that you know who your partners are. And then in terms of training a new kind of scientific leader, um, our students at the undergraduate gradu and graduate level were very involved in this. They were part of a team. And that, that value of being part of an interdisciplinary team, even if your contribution was, was disciplinary, was narrowly focused, um, was, was uh, game changing for them. It changed the, the direction of their lives. Um, and it also for us, became, for Stanford University, became a model for a new kind of graduate education, and we went on from there. Our students were the model for creating that new interdisciplinary program. Um, so we, we got a lot of institutional benefit from this research. We got a lot of research benefit. We got, I hope, a lot of benefit for the farmers in the Yaqui Valley and beyond. So what is it gonna take for a transition to sustainability? Well, yes, the things that we in academic institutions can provide but a lot of other things that, that you know, others have to join us in. I think, uh, I just wanna say a word about the last one on that list about leadership because I think ultimately that's where it's at. We have to have leaders stepping up to do this. We have wonderful leaders like Senator Mitchell who've done it there in his entire career and we have others like him coming along but we, and we have leaders like this university and, and this initiative um, and the faculty here who are, are, you know, focusing, faculty and students who are focusing their efforts on this. You are leaders for us and you become a model then for others to follow. That um, role of leadership is essential and I guess I will end by thanking you for providing it. Thank you. So uh, it's, uh, we have time for some questions. We have two folks in the audience who are uh, doctoral students involved in SSI who have microphones. So if you can, if you have a question, if you, uh, they'll be on the lookout. That's Karen over there and Mike over there. Uh, uh, Pam's happy to take some questions. And if there's any way, oh good, there's the lights. It's nice to see you actually really well. Okay. Do you think there is really any way of supporting nine billion people on the planet sustainably? Yeah. Very, uh, very good, very challenging questions. Um, question. I, I, am, um, I am an optimist, but I think it's going to be very challenging. I am not a, 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 a technology um, guru that assumes we'll, tech, we'll uh, find technologies to get ourselves out of this. I think we're going to have to be a lot more efficient and 
a lot more equitable about the way we share our resources. I think in the food realm, which is one that I work in, um, there are ways of envisioning feeding 9 billion people without completely destroying the rest of the planet, without um, wiping out all of the other species with whom we share the planet. Um, but it, it, but there, it's a, it's a multi-fold, you know, it's a multi-strategy uh, approach. And um, I keep wondering who's going to get around at the global level to get all those pieces in place. But there are, there are paths I think we can take, and um, we're going to hopefully uncover more paths as we go. The flip side of that is, does it have to be 9 billion people? And that's a, a very important question. Um, we, I think we need a stable human population. If it's 9 billion people, as I say, there are paths that you can imagine could support that population for a while. Um, but it would be a lot easier if we were eight and a half. And what do we do about that? We encourage family planning. We encourage educational opportunities for women around the world and employment opportunities for women around the world. And that alone could drop the number of, uh, the, that final number of uh, human population. Hi, I'm Stephen Mulkey. I'm president of Unity College. Um, I'm interested in your remarks about interdisciplinarity. There's, uh, you observe that, in fact, uh, there are challenges in the knowledge pipeline. In uh, implementing interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity at the, at the university level, there are intrinsic challenges in that, in, mm -hmm. in moving resources across the college boundaries and that sort of thing. I wonder if you could have a few comments about that. Yeah, that is it's a really uh, fascinating discussion. It's something I'm, I've actually been kind of a, an informal student of that. I've been studying how different universities do it. I do think that in universities where there are rel already relatively low boundaries between colleges or schools, um, it's, a mu it's much easier. Um, where in situations where there aren't dollar barriers. So for example, if you get if your department or your college gets every dollar you make teaching a student, gets all the tuition dollars, you're less likely to be you know, willing to teach with somebody else in a very different field and um, have to share the money. Or if, you're doing, if your indirect costs go into individual units, that can be a real barrier in some universities. Um, in ours at Stanford, we don't get any of the indirect costs back, so that's not a barrier. There's nothing really that gets in the way of faculty working together across the university in interdisciplinary teams. The biggest problem we have is when we want to hire interdisciplinarians, and that's where you really need to change the structure of the university. I have to say the University of Maine does it better than anybody I've seen. You've got lots of people who fit well in your units even though they are kind of interdisciplinarians. Um, but that's a, that's, that's a big challenge because most of our universities are still structured as though, as they were in the 14th century, you know. Um, um, one way that it, people are getting around it is to create um, new schools or highly modified schools whose job it is to bring the knowledge base necessary, whether it's disciplinary or interdisciplinary, whether it's social or natural or technology sciences whatever is needed uh, to, to bear on this. And so that's one way to get around it. The other way is to create institutes that, or initiatives that have resources to incentivize the departments and schools to play. But it's, it's not easy. One last question. Uh, I was curious about the actual efforts to educate or help educate decision makers. We, we know not all are receptive to learning? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think one, I, I, I probably should turn it over to some of the real experts here to answer that question, but, but I would say that um, once we get to the point where we recognize that every kind of knowledge and information is important, and the knowledge that comes from experience and, um, you know, trying things over time, the knowledge that many decision makers, whether they're educated or not, um, carry, when we come to the, recogni recognition, <laughs> the recognition that that's important and that we're looking for ways to merge that with new kinds of information um, and, and integrate them so that they can work together, those different kinds of knowledge can work together, I think we're better off. 
um, that educates everybody. It educates the decision makers as well as the researchers who are trying to be helpful and useful to them. But others may have a much better answer. Thank you. All right. So now it's. Thank you. So I have a couple gifts for Pam, who's come all this way, had wonderful meetings with our <laughs> students and faculty. Of course, everyone gets a messy t shirt. Uh, Maine Sustainability Solutions Initiative. It's just the acronym, nothing more. <laughs> um, but also, uh, maybe more special, a, a red maple leaf from Ooh. a local potter, terracotta, Aww. very special. Beautiful. It's great to have you here. So thank, thank you, you, Pam. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I now have the pleasure of turning the podium over to our president, President Paul Ferguson, who has been a huge supporter of the Sustainability Solutions Initiative. And many of the things Pam's talked about in terms of uh, this commitment to society, to interdisciplinarity, to solutions, is a big part of his vision and a source of inspiration for all the team. Paul. Well, thank you, David. Uh, and thank you so much for your leadership. It's been an exciting ride. Pam, welcome to campus in Maine. Thank you so much for affirming who we are. We're very proud that you've noticed how wonderful we're doing. It's, it's just wonderful. And thank you also for affirming uh, Senator Mitchell's role in sustainability. I, I think you will find a, a rare leader like him who truly does have a passion for linking knowledge to action. And Senator, it's always a pleasure to have you on campus to celebrate that. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Senator George Mitchell to you. Um, I've had a wonderful opportunity to get to know him this year. Having grown up from away, uh, sometimes you get a different perspective of leaders across the country. And certainly in Maine, Senator Mitchell really requires no introduction. From someone who grew up in Southern California, you watched an individual who brought to the United States Senate an incredible quality of leadership. That leadership began in Waterville, Maine. You all know him growing up in Maine, a strong Mainer, had a very distinguished law career, federal judiciary career, before he moved into the United States Senate and served with great distinction, becoming the Senate Majority Leader, served for 15, 16 years in the United States Senate, and had a great record for environmental legislation, American with Disabilities Act, a real compassion for linking that knowledge to action and developed a very strong characteristic for compromise, kind of that main way. But consistent with that exemplary leadership, even post his Senate career, Senator Mitchell became very active in business and philanthropic activities. He formed the Mitchell Institute, which really does provide many Maine students with an opportunity to achieve their vision and dreams, just like he did coming out of Waterville, Maine. And that particular scholarship program is truly transforming young people going to college today. Probably one of the most recent uh, and significant impacts that Senator Mitchell has enjoyed reflects his response to the invitation of several United States presidents. In 1995, he was named the US Special Envoy to Northern Ireland by President Clinton. And in, in 2009, the US Special Envoy for Middle East Peace by President Obama. And what was the reason that he was chosen over a significant period of time, two different presidents, because of that particular quality. And if you've ever had the opportunity to read his book coming out of the Northern Ireland Peace Accords, I really would encourage you to get it. It's entitled Making Peace, and it really talks about the Good Friday Agreement. And what comes out of that book, has been referred to in many ways, is a wonderful triumph of patience. And in fact, one reviewer referred to it as Senator Mitchell's humility shines through. Now, it's really kind of interesting, going back to observing Senator Mitchell's career, patience and humility that's allowed him to be so successful in bridging tremendous international compromises. And it seems to be kind of the main way, doesn't it? This legacy of leadership in our leaders. It's a rare combination that Senator Mitchell has brought to us in the state of Maine, to the center, and Senator, if you'll permit me, I'm going to quote you from the 2004 uh, water conference in Augusta. Uh, 2004, you might think that might be out of date, but I think it has great timeliness, perhaps prophetic. 
But let me just quote to you what the senator said to a, a, conferee, conf a conference of environmentalists and legislators and decision makers, no doubt encouraging them to link knowledge and action. There is much acrimony in this country and throughout the world today. Somehow, we must recommit to basic tenets of stewardship, cooperation, harmony, service for fellow humans, and yes, some sacrifice for the good of our common future. That's our challenge. We must make it our destiny. I think it still applies in 2012 in, in very significant ways. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome to the podium Senator George Mitchell. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for that uh, very generous introduction. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your warm reception and for your presence. Uh, this is the second time today I've been introduced, and uh, over the past few weeks and the coming few weeks, I'll, I'll be speaking around the country and outside the country, and I'll get a lot of introductions. There's a risk uh, to one's mental health to be introduced so often uh, because there is a human tendency to start believing the kinds of things that you hear uh, in these introductions. And so I like to remind myself of my experience uh, when I completed my work in Northern Ireland after five years. I wrote a book about my experience and I came back to the U.S. and I embarked on a tour of the country to promote sales of the book. Thank you, Paul, for your promotion <laughs> here today. Uh, and I learned several things, one of which is uh, that uh, there are many Irish Americans, but there are more Irish American organizations than there are Irish Americans in this country. And every one of them invited me to come to promote my book there. And, and I went to several of them, and there developed an informal competition among my Irish hosts as to who could give the longest, the windiest, the most exaggerated introduction of me as I went along. And I, traveling across the country, uh, my head got bigger and bigger. I started to believe all this stuff. And when I got to the last stop on my tour, it was in Stamford, Connecticut the Stanford Irish American Club, my head was so swollen that I could just barely get inside the front door of the building. And when I did, the first person I encountered was an elderly woman who rushed up to me. She had a large poster in her hand, and she said, I'm so excited to meet you. She said, I, I don't live anywhere near here, but I drove three hours just to shake your hand and to ask if you would sign my poster. And of course, I was flattered, and I said, well, certainly I will. And I shook her hand, and then she handed me the poster and a pen. And I looked at it. Before I signed it, I said to her, I think there's something I should tell you. She said, what's that? I said, I'm not Henry Kissinger. <laughs> the poster was a big picture of Henry Kissinger. She looked shocked. She said, you're not? Well, who are you anyway? And when I told her, she said, oh my God, that's terrible. <laughs> she said, I drove three hours to meet Henry Kissinger and all I've got is you. And I said, well, I'm sorry you feel so bad. I wish there's something I could do. She thought for a while, she said, well, there is something. I said, what is it? She said, nobody will ever know the difference. <laughs> she said, would you mind signing Henry Kissinger's name to my poster? <laughs> so I did. Now, here's the best part of the story. A couple of months ago, Henry and I appeared jointly on a program in New York, and I told that story. And later, well, then we both spoke and we answered questions. And on the way out, he said to me, I've been with you several times. He said, I've never heard a better talk than you gave tonight. I said, well, what part of it did you really especially like? He said, well, that story you told in the beginning. <laughs> He said, I think you should tell that more often around the country. <laughs> so here I am uh, telling that story again. Uh, I want to say first that uh, uh, 
it's a really a pleasure for me to be back at the University of Maine. Uh, my family uh, has two graduates uh, of the University of Maine Adorno, and I'm pleased to say that they're both here, my brother Paul, who is here, and my sister Barbara, who is here. Would you please both stand up and re be recognized <laughs> as alumni? <clears throat> Also present, I think, seated somewhere else, I can't see him, is my brother Johnny, who had the misfortune of not attending the University of Maine. He went to the University of Rhode Island. He also has been a great inspiration uh, in my life. Now, Paul and I, we were all here on the campus just a few weeks ago to dedicate uh, the Paul Mitchell Batting Pavilion over by the Fieldhouse. I don't know if any of you have seen it or not, uh, it's, he's, Paul is on the Board of Trustees of the University. It's really remarkable in several instances, for several reasons, not least of which is he is the only guy who hit 250 while he was in college and got a building named after him, <laughs> uh, uh, which is really is kind of amazing. Imagine if he'd hit three or 400, why he probably would have put up a new field house for him, wouldn't you, Paul? Uh, secondly, he really was recognized because of his contributions to economic theory. Every one of you has understood, thanks to many intelligent economists, the theory of inflation. And you know that prices rise over time. Well, my brother Paul is the first one to establish the principle, the economic principle, that batting averages like prices rise over time. He may have been a 250 hitter while he was at the University of Maine, but as of this spring, it's up to 350. <laughs> and if he lives long enough, he's going to pass Ted Williams' 406 record average. But Paul, we do appreciate all your contributions to the university, and I'm pleased to recognize you. He told me tonight that every time I come to the University of Maine, I have to spend five minutes on him before I get to the subject matter, and I think I've just about done it. So I want to... Uh, also, thank Pam for coming. That really was wonderful, Pam. You've played a tremendous leadership role in mobilizing the research community to help tackle the complex problems of sustainable development. And we are inspired and moved by your words and your work. And I ask all of you, ladies and gentlemen, to join me in another round of applause and a real main welcome for Pam Matson. As uh, Pam indicated, more than 20 years ago, I wrote a book about sustainability problems, the world on fire, saving an endangered earth. Uh, but even then, I could not anticipate the extent to which the problems exist and the inability of humans, including we in this country, uh, to take the lead in dealing with them. And as a result, uh, problems have grown. Uh, challenges have arisen in many different contexts, including the need to increase our food and energy security, to enhance the livability of our cities and towns, to improve the management of our forests and fisheries, and significantly to respond to a changing climate. It seems almost incredible, given the overwhelming scientific evidence of change in our climate and the potentially devastating effects it could have, that we still have in this the wealthiest and among the most educated nations in, all, in the country, in the world, and in all of human history, men and women in leadership positions who deny the existence of climate change who describe it as a hoax, who think that there's nothing we ought to do about it when in fact it threatens not so much us today, but future generations. And these issues are inherently and especially challenging because they involve complex connections between human well-being and environmental protection, between the present and the future 
And I say that not in a sense of time, but in a sense of humans, between people alive today and people as yet unborn, who will be those principally bearing the consequences of our inaction. Between the local and the global, a very real problem in dealing with environmental impacts because it's very hard to convey to a single individual that his or her inaction or his or her refraining from action can have an impact on the global climate. And especially and finally, as Pam indicated, between knowledge and action. Those who oppose action on global climate change almost invariably retreat into the comfortable assertion that we're not 100 percent sure, that there still are some scientists who disagree, there are still are some facts unknown or in dispute. And they demand that before we take corrective action, we have 100 percent certainty. Well, of course, we all know that by the time we have 100 percent certainty, the consequences will be so severe and irreversible that we'll not be able to deal with them. And we also know that in almost every area of human activity, including our daily lives, including the most critical decisions in our lives, we act on less than 100 percent of absolute certainty. Indeed, frequently we act on instinct, on reaction, even with a limited amount of knowledge. We have to better make the case to all of our fellow citizens that these global threats, while they may reach their peak of adversity in the future, demand action now. And we also have to get over the tendency to think about these problems in abstract terms. They are and the consequences will be felt by real people in local environments, in specific places all around the globe. Well, I'm pleased to say that right here, through Maine's Sustainability Solutions Initiative, the University of Maine and collaborators around the state are trying to deal with these problems in a very real and timely way, to try to help solve pressing problems with, that have within them interconnected economic, social, and environmental factors. Whether the issue concerns town planning, the future of Maine's forests, renewable energy development, transportation needs, water resources, and the many other challenges we face across our state. SSI is focused on helping our economy to grow, to promote thriving communities, and all the while to do it while maintaining a healthy environment. In the Eastport area, SSI researchers are collaborating with local fishermen, along with local business and non-governmental organizations, to make sure that tidal power is developed sustainably. Another team is working with municipal planners, developers, state and federal agencies, and citizen scientists to create more flexible policies for balancing economic development and environmental protection. In these and every other project, SSI will embody many of the core principles that have guided my own efforts to solve problems and improve the prospects for peace and for the future. And they, they include a belief in using the power of partnership to search for solutions. Whether as Senate Majority Leader or while working for peace in different parts of the world, I learned the importance of trying to understand the needs and the concerns of those who face these problems in their everyday lives. In a similar way, SSI faculty and students are engaging with individual citizens as well as representatives of government, business, industry, and non-governmental organizations. Accordingly, SSI has created diverse teams of faculty and scientists, students with expertise 
in environmental, social, and the economic develop dimensions of these problems and all of their components. And I want to commend the more than 100 SSI faculty and several hundred SSI students for their resolve, their ability to overcome obstacles, their spirit of hope balanced with pragmatism. And finally, the ethos of SSI reflects the importance of public service. SSI's faculty and students have committed themselves to a goal that is larger than each individual himself or herself, the goal of helping to create a brighter future for the people of Maine. In the process, we're nurturing a cadre of educated citizens, flexible thinkers, solutions-oriented scholars. By demonstrating how this university and other universities and colleges can help our society to chart a more sustainable path for the future. In the words that Pam used to balance the needs of people with the needs of our global ecosystems, SSI is performing an important public service role that I believe will have lasting benefits for Maine, for the nation, and for the world. Finally, I want to thank Dr. David Hart for his outstanding leadership uh, of this program and Dr. Paul Ferguson for his outstanding leadership of this university. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you, Sen Thank you Senator Mitchell. A wonderful talk, and we have time for questions again uh, before we close. So we have uh, the microphones in the audience. Please feel free to raise your hand, and they'll come over, and you can ask a question. Karen? Okay. Yes? Go ahead, ma'am. Senator Mitchell, um, from your talk, it seemed that uh, your commitment to sustainability goes back to the book you referenced several years ago. Um, what would you tell to the public, and uh, I represent the Alumni Association, about why sustainability and why you mean, why you've chosen to put your face and your reputation and your prestige behind this right. effort? The problem uh, was described in, in better and more detail by Pam than I have uh, been able to, or that I know because her knowledge exceeds mine. Uh, but I, I do want to make a comment about one of the questions that was asked by this gentleman in front about can we sustain a population of nine billion, I think was the figure used. Uh, in fact, the most recent UN population projection is for around nine and a half billion uh, by the middle of this century there will be a leveling off but I think as important as the total number is the velocity of change that is occurring in such dramatic fashion nobody knows for sure when the first humans existed on earth but the best science puts it at about 200,000 years ago. The population of the Earth, the human population of the Earth, reached one billion in the 19th century. 1,800 years after the birth of Christ, more than 200,000 years after humans first set foot on Earth, the first billion in population was reached. The seventh billion, the most recent, took 13 years. There is an enormous change in the velocity of increase in addition to the absolute numbers themselves. Secondly, of the two to three billion people who will enter the Earth in the next 38 years. More than 90% of them will be born in 
less or undeveloped countries where there already is a large population of those that Pam described in her remarks as being without access to clean water, to sanitation, in many cases to good nutrition or education. So the problem is going to be greatly compounded beyond the numbers that exist. You also have an additional factor. We've seen, of course, all of the recent demonstrations across the Middle East, uh, triggered in part by religious difference. Right now, with a population of 7 billion, about one in five persons on Earth is Muslim, about 22 percent. When the population reaches nine and a half billion, 33 percent, or one in three persons on Earth, will be Muslim. And how they deal with their internal problems and how we deal with our relationship with them will be perhaps the single most important geopolitical figure in terms of the degree, intensity, and scope of conflict in the 21st century, that is, in the lives of most of the students here today. All of these have an effect, and they're all interrelated. What is most concerning is not that we haven't solved the problem, because in human affairs, there are no absolute final solutions. In human affairs, every solution carries within it the seeds of a new problem, because things change, circumstances change, technology changes. It's a process of continuous management and dealing with growth. What is disturbing is the extent to which in our country there are those who would take us back a century in terms of policy, in terms of facing these problems squarely and dealing with them. There is a, uh, an attitude of hostility to science, of hostility to knowledge and so-called intellectuals. The fact of the matter is, to deal with these problems, we humans need the benefit of every good brain on Earth. And we surely here in this country need the benefit of every single one of our citizens going as high and as far and gaining as much knowledge and skill as their talent and willingness to work will take them. We are all in this together. This is something that we have to deal with and we require the best efforts of all in a positive, forward-looking, science-based effort to deal with the many problems that accompany the many benefits we have as citizens of this great country. It's hard to follow up after that, but my, my concern, I work in government and work in sustainable landscaping and other, other areas, is that it's very hard to find scientists that are good communicators. And I think that one of the biggest challenges for the university is to prepare more scientists that are better communicators. I, you know, I work with folks from landscapers and homeowners all the way up to aerial pesticide applicators. And we're always talking about, you know, the science and trying to get people to understand the science and accept the science. And it's almost impossible to do because there are so many other people out there talking about things that aren't really science, but they're perceived to be science. So how do we better prepare scientists, I'm a graduate of this university, to be able to communicate their findings so that people understand them and accept them? Well, of course, y your question is a very good one, and it's a reminder of the reality that knowledge and skill is not just the memorization of certain tidbits of information. 
And it's not just knowing more about something, it's being able to understand and communicate it. And that means, of course, a better, broader effort at education at every level in our society. Uh, and one of the reasons why I think it is so critical that those of us who have the benefits of education, everybody in this room who is either a graduate or a student is, in a sense, a privileged person. Because each of us has received something that, in the, across the whole sweep of human history, very, a very small portion of people have achieved. That is, this degree of, this level of knowledge and education. And we have to do our best to do a better job of training people broadly so that even the least scientifically inclined among us has at least a basic understanding of the importance of science in our lives and the enormous benefits which we have derived from it and the huge disadvantages that we confront if we ignore it, but also, as you clearly suggest, people who do have scientific knowledge and skill acquire the ability to convey that knowledge to others uh, in understandable and terms that will not come across as arrogant and knowing it all. It's being able to speak to people on their own terms in the way uh, they understand it. Uh, it. It's not an easy challenge, but, but I really think we're capable of it. I, I, uh, I, I read the papers and articles like everyone else here, and I read all these predictions of American decline, uh, and I frankly very strongly disagree with it. I, I think that the 21st century will be, will be a period of uh, greater American participation and contribution uh, to the world uh, than ever before, some, for some of the reasons which I've suggested in my, uh, because of the circumstances that I discussed in my answer to the earlier question, but also because I think we have demonstrated that despite our many imperfections, and let's face it, we're all human and we all make, fall, uh, make mistakes and have faults, individuals as well as as a society, there remains in this country what very few countries have or have had, and that is a flexibility, an openness, a willingness to acknowledge error, a willingness to embrace change. And, and, and I want to close with one quotation uh, that I've been struck with, uh, struck by. The, uh, y there's a tendency on the part of people, humans everywhere, to look backward with rose-colored glasses, always to imagine that the past was better than it really was, and to look forward with blinders, always imagining that the future will be worse than it's going to be. And it's an, a human reaction to change. There is an almost innate fear of change because of the uncertainty that it brings and because of the prospect that it, most people think of life as a fixed sum. If someone else gets something, it means I get less. There's a quotation, I don't have it with me, so I'll paraphrase, but it's almost exactly verbatim. God is gone, faith is gone, men can no longer be trusted and believed, and traditional values are being lost. Those words were written in Greece in the year 555 B.C. More than a half century before the birth of Christ, the Greek city-states were moving in a period of transition from dictatorship to oligarchy to a rudimentary form of democracy. And the writer was a member of one of the oligarch families. And to him, the notion that the common people would participate in local governments meant a loss of traditional values, a decline in faith, the absence of belief in God. It tells you that from the dawn of civilization, people have wanted to preserve what they have, have feared that the future will bring something worse, and have regarded their society as a fixed pie. 
So if someone else who doesn't have anything gets something, it must mean I'm going to get less. Well, the reason why America has been so successful over 225 years is we have generally operated under a different belief, that we can bake a bigger pie. And if this fellow over here who doesn't have an education gets one, it not only benefits him, it benefits me. If a guy without a job gets a job and gets paid, he's going to buy a refrigerator. And that means the refrigerator company hires more people. And their workers will buy cars. And that means the car makers will hire more people. And so on in a virtuous circle of growth and prosperity. We've got to get away from this notion that if we help the least and the poorest among us, it's simply an act of charity and that somehow we're giving them something and we're not getting back. We all benefit from a rising tide that lifts all of our boats, including every single member of our society, whatever their background, whatever their history, whatever their family status. That's what made America great. This is a country of freedom and opportunity for every single member of society. And our challenge is to see to it that we expand the American pie and we give a piece of it to everybody in our country. Thank you all very much. Great to be here. Senator Mitchell mentioned a rising tide, uh, and of course we ran out and got this present real fast based on those words. It's uh, from Edgecombe Pottery in Maine, uh, Maine Potters. Uh, it's a, a muscle, middleus edgeless, so take that with you, George. Thank we appreciate you. it. Thank you. On behalf of the entire SSI team and the entire UMaine community, I just want to thank Pam and George for taking so much time out of their busy schedules to be with us. Uh, these are powerful uh, stories and experiences and wisdom and inspirational visions. And I can tell you for sure that the SSI team, especially uh, their words and even more so their deeds, use that to guide our own work. So thank you very much, everybody, for being here and join us for the reception down at uh, the Collins Center. Thank you.